Hi, everyone. I'm just giving uh, this a minute as I see the participant number going up just to make sure that everyone's logging in. As you're joining, for those of you joining, I think our number is still going up a little bit. Um, just note that uh, for today's workshop, you will only be able to see and hear the three of us, the workshop um, editors and coordinators for today. We'll introduce ourselves in just a minute. I'm just going to wait just a tad longer um, before we do that. Make sure everybody can hear us and see us. I'll wait till my clock clicks 12 of two <laughs> and then I'll start introductions. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to begin. So some folks might come in and out uh, throughout the next 45 minutes to an hour, um, but we'll open just by introducing ourselves so that you can see us and hopefully you can hear us fine. Um, I'm Julie Preble, one of the co-editors of, of the WLN workshop series and welcome everybody to the workshop series. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I'm an associate professor and chair of the Writing and Rhetoric Department at Occidental College, where I'm also the Writing Programs and Writing Center Director. Um, I am an avid reader of WLN, have been for many years, and have had the privilege to publish in the journal as well. So we'll introduce the co-editors following. Hello, my name is Sohee Lee, and I'm the faculty director of the Writing and Multi-Literacy Center at California State University, Channel Islands. Um, I've also had the privilege of publishing in WLN, and I am an associate editor of workshops with WLN. And hi, I'm Elizabeth Kleinfeld. I'm a professor of English, and I direct the Writing Center at Metropolitan State University of Denver. And I've been a voracious reader of WLN since pretty close to the beginning. And I'm obviously one of the associate editors that's doing these webinars, too. Okay, folks, so this is the order. Our order of introduction is the order in which we will um, talk with you today through the various components of our workshop presentation. And now there'll be a little bit of a pause because I'm going to transition from this uh, screen where you can see us all to sharing my screen, um, which will hopefully show you my part of the presentation. So uh, be patient as I do that. Um, Ideally, you can see my screen. Elizabeth and Sohi, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so if they can see it, hopefully everyone can see it. All right, so uh, this is the official welcome page. Um, welcome to the first workshop in the new WLN workshop series, Introduction to Publishing in WLN. Uh, everyone hopefully can hear and see this as we move forward. And as I mentioned earlier, though some of you may have joined after I said this, uh, for today's workshop, due to the large number of participants, and yay, um, uh, you will only be able to see and hear the three of us, the workshop coordinators for today. Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. Don't know what happened here. Hopefully I'll be able to figure this out. <laughs> Um, this is our workshop agenda for today, uh, and we're going to go in the order um, presented here, and please note that we will uh, answer questions at the end of our presentation, and uh, there will be a little bit of a lag uh, or transition time as we toggle between the various components of the workshop, and one of us stops sharing our screen and the other one moves into there, so just FYI on that. 
and I'm having some trouble toggling through my own today. Um, all right. Uh, so now the workshop begins. So we're pleased to launch this part of WLN's new author support program consisting of workshops to help writers publish in WLN and contribute to the field of writing center studies. The workshop program aims to bring new voices into WLN by supporting authors in the the early stages of their thinking and writing, and will cover topics such as how to develop ideas for articles and how to contribute to ongoing Writing Center conversations. Stay tuned for details about upcoming workshop topics on the WLN website. As associate editors, our role is to provide information about WLN and topics on publishing to prepare authors to submit articles to WLN. We aim to encourage an expanded authorship in the journal through these workshops. We do not read any submissions. A note about the format of today's workshop. For today's workshop, the chat function in this Zoom webinar is not turned on. Instead, at any point, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, during the presentation, you can type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will go through our entire slide presentation and respond to all the questions at the end. And please note, this workshop is being recorded and will be available later on the WLN website. All right, so just wanted to start with a, a screenshot of the WLN website homepage itself, just so that you know where to find us. And the WLN website is easy to find and easy to navigate with information about how to submit articles and a helpful and expansive archive of WLN articles. We will go through many parts of the website in our presentation today, particularly in the subscribe and submit portions. I'll start with just a brief overview of the history of the journal, and you can find all of this information as I've circled there in the archives um, box or tab in WLN. So WLN started in 1976 by Muriel Mickey Harris, who was at that time the director at Purdue University's Writing Lab, after a C session when Mickey realized Writing Center folks needed a more regularized way to keep in touch and share knowledge, resources, and experiences with one another. On the WLN website, under archives, you can find a useful history of the journal in articles and links to additional resources about WLN. In 2016, there was a journal name change from Writing Lab Newsletter to WLN, a Journal of Writing Center Scholarship. The name change acknowledges both the history of the journal with its emphasis on the lab as a place where people try things out and learn new processes and the development of the field of writing center studies more recently. The new name aims to give authors a more recognizable journal title for their CVs, which can be helpful for review and promotion files. But the journal has always been a peer reviewed journal, whether under its old title or the new one. The WLN website includes information on what WLN looks for in submissions, and both Sohi and Elizabeth will dig deeper into the genres and topics that are appropriate for WLN. Briefly here though, in overview, it may be helpful to note that article submissions must be writing center focused with an emphasis on something that has been tried in a writing center. Articles should address issues that are of importance and relevant to most writing centers and those working in writing centers. Articles might also focus on current trends across writing centers nationally and internationally. As noted previously, similar to other w, uh, writing center journals, excuse me, all submissions to WLN are peer reviewed. However, there are some features that distinguish WLN from other writing center journals. Manuscript submissions to WLN should be under 3,000 words and under 1,500 for the tutor's column. Compare these word counts to other journals that range from 5,000 to 10,000 words. As mentioned, this word count encourages a lab approach, which is distinct from other journals. The contact with WLN editors throughout the submission, review, and editorial process also distinguishes WLN from other writing center journals. Authors will find that they receive great communication with the editors, as editors provide mentorship, share resources, and support and encourage authors as they help authors prepare a piece to be publication ready. 
I'm going to move through the next set of slides rather quickly. You can find this information on the WLN website, but we thought it would be helpful to put faces with names in terms of who's who at WLN. So um, Mickey is the founding editor of the journal, and as editor-in-chief, she reads incoming submissions to determine if a piece is ready for blind review process. Karen and Ted um, are joining the journal now as associate editors and are working closely with Mickey. Another component of the WLN uh, author support programs that we'll be launching soon is a new author mentoring program that you'll be hearing more about in the future. And this program aims to help authors who would like to publish in WLN as they move through the process of creating and submitting an article. And here are the associate editors for the mentoring program. We've already introduced ourselves and our roles um, at the journal. And then finally, some other folks that keep the journal running. Uh, Elizabeth uh, is the assistant editor who keeps track of the day-to-day -day business of the journal, and Brian is the blog editor. Um, the journal is printed with the support and help of Richard and Carla Hay, and that's uh, just a screenshot of their organization on um, at LL, 26 LLC. Elizabeth will provide more details later in the workshop about WLN submission guidelines. But in brief, this is the process on the screen from submission through review at WLN. And you can find this information as I've circled here under the submit tab on the website. When an author decides to submit to WLN, it is worthwhile to review the important information section in the submit guidelines on the, on the WLN website. Once it's determined that an article is appropriate for WLN and ready for review, it is sent for blind peer review. Peer reviewers weigh in on whether the article is publishable or could be if revised. And then finally, my last slide just provides you with um, a shot of the acceptance rates at WLN over the last several years. So WLN acceptance rates are very competitive with other top tier writing center journals and typically range from 12 to 16%. In the past two years, the journal has published a larger than usual number of special issues. And so the acceptance rates more recently have ranged from 16 to 20%. Okay, so this ends my portion of the presentation, and we'll transition to the next section of the workshop led by Sohi. Great, um, so I'm Sohi, and right now I'm working here to make sure that I could launch my presentation. Uh, just one second. So um, I'll be talking about scholarly articles in WLN for this portion of the webinar. Now, um, so WLN publishes three types of manuscripts. Scholarly articles, uh, which range from one to two, I mean, about two per issue. Um, book reviews, that's usually one per issue. And tutors column, which run from one to two per issue. Um, this particular workshop, however, will be focusing on scholarly articles. So within this category, there are uh, what we imagine as two major types of scholarly articles. These are um, the research theory-based uh, scholarly article, and these offer original research or introduce theories that provide insight on existing writing center practices or introduce new writing center practices. The practitioner's narrative usually showcases a specific program or practice of a center. So the first major type of scholarly article in WLN is what we call the research theory-based article. And these articles have the following features in common. They offer original research or introduce theories provide insight into existing writing center practices and pedagogy, and discuss how other centers might apply it. We'll be using Tracy Santos, listening into the writing center, back channel and gaze, as an example of research theory-based article. This article was published in the May-June 2016 issue of WLN. And as a side note, I just wanted to let our webinar participants know that Elizabeth Kleinfeld will be discussing how to find this article 
and other WLN articles later in this webinar. But getting back to Santa's article, it follows a structure similar to most research theory-based um, articles. It includes an introduction, background or context, argument of research theory, discussion assessment, and then finally suggestions for application. The introduction section of the research theory-based article sets up the problem, establishes relevance, and may also provide a brief scholarly context for the issue. It answers the question, what is the problem? I provided here a clip from the first paragraph of Santa's article, and um, it poses a key question about the problem being addressed. Is listening really as invisible as we might imagine? The goal of Santa's article is to answer this question and offer arguments for how listening is visible and how it can be taught in our tutor training. The background or context section usually establishes the issues by providing a short literature review on the topic so that we can understand how existing scholarly conversations, whether it is within or outside our field, um, uh, matter. So in this case, Santa starts by contextualizing the topic outside the field and within writing studies. He introduces ideas about listening by Boxer, Brufi, and Lefebvre. In the research theory-based article, the background or context section also situates the author's work within the scholarship. So it answers the question, how does your approach or idea respond to existing approaches or ideas? In addition to providing background on how scholars or researchers might have addressed the issue, Santa responds to these ideas to position his argument, particularly in light of writing center work. Santa asks in this screenshot excerpt, can we make listening more visible, more legible to all participants in tutorial interactions? He answers this question in the next section, the argument of research or theory. The argument of research or theory section provides the case for the research or theory being applied. It answers the question, how does it work? Santa's argument of theory is to argue for listening <clears throat> that can be made more visible through back channeling and gaze and that we can teach tutors to be more aware of how we make listening visible. Santa spends substantial part of his article providing theory and application examples of both strategies of back channeling and gaze. So this is an example of Santa's case study on the gaze. The top example is a screenshot of Santa's introduction of Irving Goffin, Goffman's work on the gaze. It's the theory portion of his argument. Shortly after, Santa directly connects Goffman's theory with application in his tutor training course. Here are the class observations of apprentice tutorials. The discussion assessment section of the research theory-based article focus on providing a critical reflection on the theory or approach that the author is advocating. This section includes investigating to what degree the research or theory might work, what are the limitations, how is the research or theory important for writing center studies. In the discussion assessment section of the article, Santa acknowledges some limitations. Eye contact might mean different things depending on one's cultural background, for instance. Nonetheless, he points to studies and other scholars that support the critical role of nonverbal cues and back channeling. He believes that listening awareness should be a critical part of tutor training. The application and conclusion section generally provides suggestions for how readers can apply the research findings or theory. Here Santa provides a list of tutor training activities for active listening under the section tutor training activities. We now move on to the second major type a scholarly article in WLN, which we call Practitioner's Narrative. These articles have the following in common. They showcase specific program or practice of a center. They provide insight on how the program or practice is set up and why it is successful. 
or they discuss, and I'm, I'm sorry, they discuss how it can be a model for other centers. So we'll be uh, using Lisa Zimarelli and Victoria Bridges article, Service Learning, Tutor Education, a Model of Action, as an example of a practitioner's narrative article published in the March-April 2016 issue of WLN, it follows a similar structure to the research theory-based articles. Their practitioner's narratives includes introduction, background or context, an argument of practice, discussion assessment, and suggestions for application. So as you might notice here, the goals of the introduction is similar to the research theory-based article, the goal is to set up the problem and establish the relevance. In the introduction, Zimarelli and Bridges note that service learning is gaining popularity, but it is challenging for writing centers to incorporate it into tutor education. In their background section, conveniently <laughs> um, labeled background, uh, Zimarelli and Bridges addresses the question, what is it? They provide a general description of the project or program and include the writing center context. The argument of practice section answers the question how it works. Zimarelli and Bridges describe their service learning model, a combined model of class and writing center, and explain how they collaborated with their community partners, what they modified in the course, and how they assess tutor performance. They break their argument of practice into three sections with subheadings, combined models, partnership, and transforming tutor education into service learning tutor education. The practitioner's narrative also includes a discussion assessment of practice. In the follow-up to the argument of practice, Zimarelli and Bridges spend substan substantial space in their article, a section titled Tutors and Bridges student rewards, devoted to how they assess the results and the reflection on how it worked. They assess their program's impact on students through essays they wrote, GPA movements, and feedback. And like most scholarly articles in WLN, the authors of the practitioner's narrative also provide suggestions for application, answering the question, how can we replicate it? Zimarelli and Bridges provide four, success, um, four success factors that they discovered in their assessment of their program and share it with the readers. They end their article with a formal conclusion section, though many authors combine application and conclusion as well, like Tracy Santa. So uh, to conclude, we find that these two types of scholarly articles research theory-based article and practitioner's narrative have the following in common. The introduction section addresses questions such as, why should we care? How is it relevant to writing center practitioners and scholars? The background context section addresses questions such as, what is it? How have others in the field or relevant field discussed it? And the argument of research theory section, they address questions such as, what new insight are you offering, theory or data, or how does it work, practice or program? The discussion assessment addresses the question such as, to what degree does it work? Are there any limitations? Why is this work important? And finally, the application conclusion section addresses the question, how can we try it too? The conclusion might also address how this work might more broadly contribute to our field. So this ends my portion of the webinar. Please feel free to ask me any questions at the end of the presentation. But our next presenter is Elizabeth Kleinfeld and she'll be speaking more on topics and themes covered in WLN. So I'm just trying to get out of the screen share and there you go. All right. Is everyone seeing my slides? Not yet. Oh, I'm not actually. No, okay, hold on. Let's try it again. How about now? Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, so he focused on, um, 
outlining the two main structures that we see articles falling into. And um, what I want to do is show how those two structures can manifest themselves through a variety of different topics and approaches and um, kind of give you a sense of how the same topics can show up over and over again in WLN, but because they're being approached differently, um, there's, there's still room for those articles to be published. And so um, if you are someone who has maybe the seed of an idea for an article and you look at an issue of WLN and you see someone else has published on that topic and, and your first thought might be, oh, you know, I should have published sooner because now that idea is taken. That's not really how it works. As you'll see, as I go through my slides, um, there are lots of topics that come up over and over again. And because they're being approached from different perspectives, there's plenty of room for them in the conversation. So first, I want to look at three articles that uh, take different approaches to the concept of directing a writing center. And um, directing a writing center is a hugely popular topic in WLN. And so um, the first article I'm going to look at is Joyce Kincaid's The Writing Center Director as Archivist, The Documentation Imperative. And what Kincaid did is realize um, that Writing center directors are creating tons and tons of documents all the time. We've got um, assessment reports, we have um, annual reports, we have tutorial reports, um, we have schedules, we have marketing materials. And she realizes that after directing writing centers and always getting rid of those materials when they're no longer currently useful. She realizes that um, she wishes she had taken more of an archival approach. And so what she argues in this article is that directors should be actually archiving their materials and actually working with university libraries to officially archive those materials to make them available to people who are interested in histories and, and archival work. Um, another article that deals with directing a writing center is Lori Baker's article, What Writing Center Directors Need to Know About Regional Accreditation. And she talks about how um, writing center directors are used to being accountable and writing reports to demonstrate their accountability, but that there are other things beyond the writing center that writing, ce that writing center directors should be um, fluent with. And um, so she then talks about her own experience of being on the um, accreditation self-study committee at her university, taught her a lot about regional accreditation and that a lot of what she learned actually informed her writing center work. And so um, this is kind of a, um, not quite a how-to manual, but it's like, um, it's definitely a um, director's, or I'm sorry, a practitioner's narrative that walks people through what she learned about regional accreditation that was useful to her as a writing center director. And then the last one that I want to look at is Michelle Miley's Feminist Mothering, a Theory Practice for Writing Center Administration. This would be um, a theory research or a research theory-based article. And what Miley does is talk about how the um, we've kind of in writing center studies tried to distance ourselves a little bit from the um, maternal metaphors of writing center directing and, you know, writing center directors being warm and nurturing and things like that. And we've been, um, a lot of the literature has, has been pushing back against that. And what Miley suggests is that by pushing back against that, um, we could be closing the door on some useful productive ways of looking at motherhood. And so she lays out a theory where instead of focusing on a patriarchal theory of mothering, we would be looking at a feminist theory of mothering and, and looking at how that could inform our writing center practice. <coughs> Three articles dealing with directing writing centers, but, but all very different articles. Um, next, I want to look at three different articles that deal with identity. Um, and again, identity is one of those topics that comes up time and time again, and it should continue to come up time and time again because it will continue to be relevant to the work that we do. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk again about Michelle Miley's article except to say that it also is an example of an article that talks about identity. And so that demonstrates that these categories that I've come up with are really fluid and, and they're um, you know, very permeable boundaries between them. Um, Another article that fits into the identity category is Andrea Scott's article, The Storying of Writing Centers Outside the U.S., Director Narratives and the Making of Disciplinary Identities in Germany and Austria. Um, in this article, Scott shares empirical research that she did where she surveyed and interviewed writing center directors in Germany and Austria to find out what they're doing there, how it's similar and different to what we're doing in the US. And um, what we really like about this article is that it um, 
takes a view that is more global. It's, it gets outside the U.S. And um, later when I talk about um, submission guidelines, um, you'll see that one of the things we're highlighting is that articles don't have to be about traditional university writing centers in the U.S. Um, articles about writing center work in high schools or internationally and um, in other types of venues are more than welcomed. And then uh, the final one in the identity care category that I want to look at is Malkiel Cho Seeds, how are learning centers working out, maintaining identity during consolidation. And Cho Seeds Writing Center was in a situation that a lot of us are finding our writing centers in, where we're being absorbed into larger learning centers. And so he wanted to talk about how he was concerned that the identity of the writing center would be lost when it was absorbed into the, the new learning center and how he was really concerned about that and wanted to find ways to preserve, maintain, and even strengthen the um, identity of the writing center as part of the learning center, but still its own separate entity. And so um, he does a practitioner's narrative and talks about how what he ended up doing was really grounding his identity as a professional in an established discipline, that discipline being writing center studies and how that worked for him. And then the third topic that um, is kind of a perennial topic in WLN is tutor recruitment, training, and retention. Um, this, if, if you're on the W Center listserv, you know that this is probably the most popular topic to come up in discussion, and um, so it is in WLN as well. So um, the first article is um, the Zimmerelli and Bridges article that so he talked about, Service Learning Tutor Education, a Model of Action. The next one is Tammy Conard Salvo and John Baumkamp's public documentation of tutors work, digital badges in the writing center. And they share a plan that they came up with so that their um, peer tutors would be um, getting digital badges for that would recognize them and acknowledge them for mastering tutoring skills. And um, the last one in this category is Megan Swihart Jewell and Joseph Cheadle's Toward a Professional Consultant's Handbook, Researching Support and Training Methods. And they talk about how um, they have both peer consultants and professional consultants in their writing center. And for a long time, they had just one manual for both types of consultants. But over time, they realized that the professional consultants had a different set of concerns and circumstances that weren't always covered in the manual that they had that was supposed to be useful to both types of consultants. And so they ended up developing, um, oh, sorry, they ended up developing two separate um, handbooks, one for the peer consultants and one for the professional consultants. And so this is their practitioner's narrative about how they did that. So as you can see, um, there's always room um, to cover an old topic in a new way. Um, and I hope that you also saw that um, co-authoring as well as single authoring is, is both very welcomed in WLN. And also that there's many different ways to take those two structures that so he talked about, the um, research theory-based article or the practitioner's narrative, and um, use it regardless of what topic or, or approach you want to take. So what I want to turn our attention to now are the manuscript guidelines. Um, this information is all available on the WLN website, um, but, um, but I want to highlight some of it because it's, it's really important and it's not always crystal clear what exactly it means or how a, a new author might um, take these things into account as they are composing. So first, um, the website states that articles focus on challenges in tutoring theory and methodology, handling ESL issues, directing a writing center, training tutors, adding computers, designing and expanding centers, and using tutorial theory and pedagogy. And that is not a list that should limit you in any way, but it should simply highlight that these are actual writing center issues. These are issues um, that um, are important in the day-to-day -day work of writing centers. And that is the kind of thing that WLN is interested in. As I already said, either single or co collaboratively authored manuscripts are welcomed. Um, Julie mentioned that there is a 3,000 word limit for articles. And um, one of the things that the founder, Mickey Harris, emphasizes is that she really wants all the articles in WLN to be ones that could be read in one sitting by a really busy director um, or a really busy tutor. And so um, these are um, fairly short by journal standards but for a reason, um, because they need to be very practical, um, ready to use, and um, fairly quick to read. Um, they need to engage with authentic real-world writing center experience. And so, um, again, 
this isn't these are this isn't the place to theorize about things without getting into the nitty gritty application of things. Um, as I said, manuscripts can focus on writing center work at a variety of different types of institutions. So universities, colleges, high schools, middle schools in the U.S. and other countries. Um, they should be geared toward both new and experienced directors. And um, one of the things that I appreciate most about WLN is that. It was super relevant to me when I was a brand new tutor, and it's also super relevant to me now as someone who's been directing writing centers for like 15 years. And so um, that is really important. These need to be articles that um, will offer new insights to people who have been directing for a long time, but still be accessible to someone who may be fairly new to the field. Um, offering new insights, experience, or research is important. A literature review is an important part of an article, but a literature review by itself would not be an appropriate article to submit to WLN. And then the last one, and this one I want to elaborate on a bit, is that articles should indicate an awareness of existing scholarship. And what that means is articles should be um, embedding themselves within an existing discussion of whatever the topic of the article is. And um, one thing that new authors, and all authors, really should be aware of is that if WLN has published something on the topic that you are writing about, you should be sure to indicate that in your literature review or somewhere within the context setting part of your article where you, where you acknowledge that you're aware that, that WLN and by extension its readers are aware of this issue and there's been talk about it and here's the nature of that talk and here's how you are contributing to that conversation. So um, the big question that a lot of newer authors and, and more seasoned authors have is, how do I find out about that existing scholarship? So I wanna show you three um, pretty straightforward ways of finding out what's already been said. And I'm going to focus on what's already been said in WLN, although of course you would want to find out what has also been said about that topic in other writing centers journals and writing studies journals. So I'm using WLN as my, my focal point. Um, so I'm going to show you how to use the WLN archive search tool, how to use Compile, and how to use Google Scholar to find out what scholarship exists on this topic already. Um, so if you go to the WLN website, which is just wlnjournal.org, um, and then click on archives, you will then um, get to a page that looks like this. Over on the left, you can see that all of the issues of WLN, um, both when it was called WLN and previously when it was called the Writing Lab Newsletter, they're all there going all the way back to the beginning in PDF form. And then there's also this place where you can search the archives. So I'm just going to do a real quick little sample search on the term listening. I was inspired by Tracy Santa's article on, on listening and want to know more. So um, if I type listening in there, then I get um, the, the search returns on the archive come up in really narrow columns. So I'm showing you um, one really long column that I just cut in half and um, posted the top and bottom next to each other just to, to be more um, readable. Um, but so you can see that um, the different issues of WLN with articles in them relating to um, listening pop up, including an interview with Tracy Santa. Um, another tool that can be really useful for finding out what's already been said is Compile, and that's just compile.org. This is a search engine that was created specifically for writing studies folks, um, and it is much more complicated than the WLN archive. Um, it's so complicated, in fact, that um, there's these search tips and glossary that it's really recommended that you look at before you start searching. If you just start um, you know, kind of searching without having looked at the search tips on the glossary, you'll pretty quickly find yourself frustrated. But if you read the search tips on the glossary, then the, um, the way that this search engine works becomes much more clear really quickly. So it's very much worth reading those. Um, and the glossary is important because Compile uses very specific search terms. So if I want to look for something about listening particular to writing centers, I have to, instead of saying writing centers as my search term, I have to use W Center, and that is revealed in the glossary. So if I go over to glossary term and type in um, listening and then W Center, which, which narrows my results to um, studies about listening related to writing centers, then I get um, 
in the bottom part of the slide, you'll see what the search returns look like. And what's really nice about Compile is that um, I can download these returns into an Excel spreadsheet. And even if I don't download them, even if I'm just using them on the screen, I can click on author or title or date or journal um, or any of those headers at the top and organize the results that way. So you can see that in the journal column, there are things from Writing Center Journal, things from the Writing Lab Newsletter and things from C's. If I click on journal, um, that would then organize my results by journal. So that way it would be really easy for me to just zero in on the, the Writing Lab Newsletter articles. Or alternatively, I could click on date and have things organized chronologically, which would make it really easy for me to figure out who's citing who and things like that. Um, and then the last search engine that I want to share with you is Google Scholar, which is scholar.google.com. This one's super easy to use. You don't have to use specialized search terms or anything like that. Um, and so if I go to the advanced search option, and I put listening in as my search term, and then down where it asks me if I want to focus on a particular journal, if I put in WLN, then it's going to return for me all the articles on listening that are specific to WLN. Um, and one thing I realized that I forgot to mention when I was talking about Compile, it does um, catalog WLN, but only back to issue 24, volume six, whereas the um, WLN, and archive has all of the WLN issues all the way back to volume one, issue one. Um, Google Scholar, because they keep their algorithms top secret, um, I don't really know how they figure out what to include and what not to include. So as you can see, as I've been talking through this, each of these three methods of finding out what's been said has some pros and some cons. And so I suggest that everyone try all three and you might find that you gravitate toward one over the other for some purposes, or you might just find that, that one of them just doesn't work for you at all for whatever reason, or you instantly fall in love with one and that's the one that you wanna to commit to forever and ever. Any of those are fine. Um, I'm not gonna tell you which one will work best for you. I'm gonna suggest that you try all three, but the really important take home point is that any manuscript that you submit to WLN needs to contextualize the, the subject of the manuscript by talking about what's already been said on this topic. Um, at this point, I'm gonna wrap up my portion of the presentation. I do wanna give you a heads up that you should have all received an email a few minutes after this webinar began that has a link to a survey that we're asking you to take. It's a really short survey um, that asks you, you know, what worked for you and what didn't work so much about the webinar. And we would really appreciate your feedback because um, the three of us will be developing more webinars and we wanna make sure that the webinars we're developing serve the purposes and needs that you have. Um, also in that email are the email addresses for the three of us. And so we're about to shift to Q&A. And um, in case there's not enough time to get to your question, or if your question pops into your head immediately after we've ended the webinar, you can always just email one or all of us and we would be happy to respond to your question that way. So at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Julie by ending my screen share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I think we may have picked up some participants uh, after we did our initial introduction of the workshop and the format of the workshop where um, we explained that the chat function is not on because of the large number of participants, but the Q&A is working. So um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, just right in the middle at the bottom, you should see a Q&A, looks like a sort of folder. Um, if you have any questions, now that you've listened to our parts of the workshop or our workshop in its entirety rather, feel free to go ahead and type in your question there and we will go through the questions and provide answers for about the next 15 minutes until um, we end. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that that Q&A function was there. So I've got to move this over so I can see the question. Um, I think I'll go ahead and read the questions or comments as they're coming in as best I can. Uh, we don't have too many just yet. Um, and then we'll see which of us should, should answer that. So the first one, um, sorry, I'm reading through it. It's a long comment. Um, I guess this is less a, 
question than a comment, but just a, a comment that uh, that the web webinar seems very valuable and thank you us for making this information accessible to everybody and again that's really the intention as I mentioned in my part of the workshop of the workshop program itself is that uh, we're trying to make um, publishing seem sort of more open and accessible to everybody and answer any questions that will encourage everyone to consider publishing in WLN so thanks for that comment uh, the question that just came in is Actually, how really, can I jump in um, that comment about the person having to leave early reminds me um, I just want to reiterate what um, I think so he or, or Julie said at the beginning that um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the WLN website so um, anyone if you have colleagues who missed it today and were sad about that um, you can let them know that this will be available for viewing later yeah, that's a good, again, since we picked up some participants after we started, yeah, I mentioned that earlier. So it'll be up there soon. Um, and so you can rewatch it. And I think it would be helpful to go through some of this too. Um, because I think that so he and Elizabeth in particular really dug deep into some details that might be useful for everybody to review later as you're considering submitting. Okay, um, question one, how long does it usually take from submission to publication? So how long is that process from submission to publication? So he or Elizabeth, do you want to take that one? Well, since the two of you have published in WLN, you could probably talk about your experiences. Um, I'll just say that in my experience and even in the information that is provided on the WLN website, that the the process is fairly quick, um, much quicker for, in my case, than any article I've published in a peer-reviewed journal before. So um, I think it also depends on uh, what your topic is and, and what you're working on. And if WLN is planning um, to try to put together different articles together uh, that work well together in some way, even if it's not a special issue. But my experience was not very long. I think the whole thing from the time I submitted to the time I got comments back for revision to the time it was published was less than six months. Okay, I can add a little bit to that too. I think that um, it does range and it depends on, um, I think if your submission requires uh, substantial revision so if it doesn't need as much revision, then it would be a lot faster. I think on average, it's like about maybe somewhere between thir six months, as Julie said, to a year is probably the average around between there, depending on, again, the revision requirements. Also, I would say, too, that it depends on whether or not it's a special issue, because a lot of the times the editors have to field between the editors of the magazine and the, the, um, the authors, and that could also just add more time to it to be honest. So it really, it does kind of depend on um, the circumstance in which you're submitting. Great. Okay, uh, next question. Um, how do I find out about special issues? Well, um, special issues of WLN, as I, I understand it, are, are often, are they're announced on the WLN website. So I think um, for me, I have a tab set to journals that I read frequently, like WLN. Um, and so I check those somewhat regularly just to see if there are any special issues that um, folks might be searching for article submissions on in case I'm maybe I'm, I'm, I'm ruminating about publishing something that might fit with that special issue. So that's one way that I would immediately look to the WLN website. Um, Elizabeth or Sohi, do you want to add anything about how to find out about special issues that might be coming up? That's a good uh, point, Julie, in terms of keeping a tab. Actually, I usually just read the W Center listserv and most of the time it's the, the, the CFPs are posted there. Um, in fact, all the time, anytime there's anything from w Center, uh, right, WLN or WCJ, usually they post uh, their um, CFPs, the call for papers on the listserv. So if you're not on the listserv, you should definitely add yourself onto it. There's also a Google calendar maintained by, is it Tracy Gardner who maintains the Google calendar with, um, call for proposal deadlines on it. So if you use Google Calendar yourself, you can just subscribe to her calendar and have all the um, CFP deadlines um, automatically showing up on your own calendar, which is really handy. That's a great tip. 
<laughs> um, okay, uh, next question. Um, the acceptance, I noted in my last slide in the presentation that the acceptance rate was around 16 to 20%. Um, I just want to note that the 16 to 20% is the acceptance rate for the special issues that WLN has published uh, in 2016 through 2018. But the acceptance rate usually ranges um, at its lowest at around 12% and hovers between 12 and 16%. Um, anyway, and the question is, how many submissions do you receive? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, since the, uh, as co-editors of the workshop, we don't see the submissions or read them, but we certainly can get an answer to that. And I would think that, of course, this number is variable um, depending on a, any particular season or year. Elizabeth, were you gonna say something? I was just thinking that um, we could do the math, you know, if, if the acceptance rate is 12 to 16% for regular issues and there's how many issues published in a year, we could do the math. Or I, I should say one could do the math. I'm not going to do the math. <laughs> because I'm not a math person, but the math could be done. <laughs> well, it could also be that if it's a special issue and it's uh, the acceptance rate ranges from 16 to 20 percent, I mean, it, we really don't know. We'd have to find out how many submissions those uh, special issue editors received mm -hmm. um, and then how many they accepted out of that. Uh, out of that. So uh, we could certainly provide some more information and follow up um, on our slide as best we can. I think it's going to be a ranging number though, so I don't know that we'll have just one number there. Yeah. Um, next question. Thanks, by the way, for people continuing to submit questions. Um, how do uh, submissions to WLN differ compared to other journals in the field, such as Praxis, Writing Center Journal, Etc. Um, so I'll turn that over to Sohi, maybe, or Elizabeth, since this taps into what you talked about in your presentation. I actually, I've published in all three. And, you know, outside of, you know, obviously there's a length. Um, uh, WCJ is, I think, more kind of interested in theory. Uh, and less practitioners type of narrative. So I think, you know, WCJ and WLM both like, th you know, the theory practice component of it, but I think WCJ wants a little bit more theory and definitely a lot more empirical uh, evidence, uh, more rigorous in that sense. But I, I would say they're really kind of on par in terms of um, a reputation. Um, both, one, because WLN is one of the oldest of our journals, very high reputation for that regard, and also just well-read in terms of dissemination, and uh, WCJ as well. So, um, so as far as submissions, I think a lot of people, especially people who publish um, actively, they, they try to publish in those two. Um, Praxy, I think, you know, again, it is also peer reviewed. So I think it's similar to the things that are published, maybe more closely to WLN than to WCJ. Um, because I think Praxy, by the nature of the name, <laughs> Praxy, it's a lot of it is interested in um, practitioners narrative and uh, our practice. And that's how I felt about it. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you have anything that you thought. Yeah, I, I just think about how every conversation I have with Mickey, she emphasizes that she wants WLN to be accessible. She mm -hmm. wants it to be something that anyone in Writing Center Studies could pick up and understand an article. And that doesn't mean that the articles aren't complex, but that someone new to the field and someone very seasoned in the field would be able to find something useful and of meaning mm -hmm. within the article. And, and she's really interested in applicability. So um, whereas, as so he said, um, Writing Center Journal might be interested in more theoretical things, WLN is, is really interested in those things that have applicability to what you're doing in the Writing Center today. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 
Um, moving on to the next question. Are there common reasons for manuscripts not being accepted? And I think, yes. yes. <laughs> and, and, and I think this, this taps into um, much of what Elizabeth was talking about in her presentation. Do you want to reiterate some of those points, Elizabeth? Yeah, so the reason that I spent so much time showing how to use those three different search tools to discover what has already been said is that um, the, uh, my understanding is that the number one reason that manuscripts are not accepted that is that they don't contextualize themselves and they don't show where the current study is in relation to other studies that have been done on, on a similar subject. And um, in, in particular, the editors who read submissions are frustrated when an article is submitted that in which the author seems to be unaware that anyone else has ever published on this particular topic, when in fact WLN very likely has published something on that topic. So that's, that is the, the main reason that, that we put a, a good deal of attention today into how to find out what has already been said. Yeah, and I would also add that the other topic that is very hot with the editors is significance, kind of really relating the kind of practice or theory that you're proposing to how other centers might be able to replicate it or do the same or just a, a sense of why it's relevant for anyone else except for your center. So it has to, if, if, if one talks about something that one, that one is doing in one center, it has to have a kind of broader relevance and significance to them. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, um, one more question here. Uh, as far as timeline, I was also wondering if you could mention a range for when we'd hear about our acceptance. So um, one of the things that I think we um, tried to emphasize, uh, and I know we're going through some of these slides really quickly, is I had a process slide up um, early in my part, and, and I don't know if the attendee was um, there for my part, just to sort of emphasize that it is a process. So it's, it's not as though it goes from submission right to acceptance. There's many different stages along the way, um, which includes um, the editor-in-chief, Mickey, and um, the new co-associate um, uh, editors giving these uh, articles a read just to see if this piece is ready to be sent out. And then it's sent out for... Um, blind peer review. And that process can, again, be somewhat variable and take a, a little bit of time because peer reviewers, of course, are, we're the peer reviewers in many cases for other journals, right? Um, and we all have busy lives and, and, and other professional obligations. So um, my understanding, and again, this is anecdotal, and we certainly can find out a little bit more information from the WLN folks on this too, is that um, WLN does give the blind peer reviewers a date and asks that they return their um, peer review um, within that time frame. And, and again, in my experience, that was a fairly short time frame. Um, but again, if you, the other thing that I think I mentioned in my presentation was that one of the distinguishing characteristics about this journal from other writing center journals, in my view at least, is a really strong um, communication with the editors. So I would just say if at any point you feel as though you've been waiting too long or you have a question about where your um, piece is at in this process as we've outlined it, I would encourage you to send an email to the WLN folks and that can be found on the WLN website. Anyone else want to add anything on this in terms of timeline? No, I, I just want to reiterate, though, that the, the editors are really open to working with authors. And um, so if, if you have questions about where your piece is in the process, by all means, send an email. And um, our experience has been that all emails to the, the editors get answered really quickly. Yes. Very much so. Okay. Um, we've gone through, I'll just pause here. For, we have about a minute left. I don't know if anyone has any remaining questions they'd like to pop into the Q&A, but we're We've gone through all the questions that have been um, asked so far. Um, if there's nothing else, then I guess we will, uh, it's, always, it's always good if a meeting ends early, I suppose. <laughs> Um, um, and then just maybe a quick reminder about the survey that Elizabeth mentioned at the end of her presentation. So everyone who's signed up and logged in today should have received a link. Elizabeth, is that right? To take the survey? Right. So there's, there's a link already in your email inbox to the survey and that link, or I mean that email also includes the email addresses for Sohee, Julie, and me. And then um, later today when we have a link 
for the um, webinar recording. I'll send another email out that has that link so you can watch the webinar over and over if you want. Well, thank you so much for joining us and we hope that you'll visit us again and we are planning on other webinars. So we definitely would love to hear not only your feedback on this, but also if in your feedback you can give us more ideas as well as far as topics are concerned, we'd certainly consider them. But we look forward to making more webinars. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, have a nice weekend.